was a CPI report out this week indicating that inflation was up 5% year over year. Um, what does that mean? Is 5% a lot? Well, yeah, 5% is a lot. I mean, historically for many years, uh, inflation as measured by the CPI uh, has been up somewhere in the area of 2% a year. Uh, so this is a notable increase. The question is twofold. What's causing it? And number two, is it going to last? Um, there is evidence that what's happening here is the bottlenecks that's been created by uh, the pandemic is causing prices to rise uh, for goods. Simple things like wrapping. Uh, Starbucks doesn't have enough coffee cups. I know that sounds like crazy, but it's true. Um, they don't have the little ketchup vials that they, they need uh, as well. So there, there is a, a, a bottleneck that's causing an increasing in the price of some uh, physical objects, commodities, and uh, things that are related to commodities. Uh, the Federal Reserve has been saying for a while now that they know and expected this to happen, and they think it's going to be, they call it transitory. That means that once the bottlenecks are resolved, prices will should come down for some of these commodity like like sandwich wrappers or coffee cups and things like that. They're probably right about that. What I'm a little more concerned about is not physical things like com commodities or you know sandwich wrappers or things like that. I'm concerned about costs to attract people into certain industries back in, like the restaurant business. Wages have gone up. I think that's good, by the way. <laughs> I'm more money in people's pockets. Yeah, I vote yes <laughs> on that. The problem is that's not transitory. You you can't claw back if you. We're paying somebody $12 an hour, and now you're going to pay them $16 an hour to get them back to work. You can't come back six months from now and say, hey, you know, everybody's back. Um, we're going to just try to pay you $12 again. You can. That has happened. But you'll find that's a lot stickier. People aren't going to give up their wage increases. If, uh, you know, if they can avoid it, they'll quit. Um, so my concern, uh, uh, Katie, is that, well, uh, sandwich wrappers or, you know, coffee cups are going to come back into supply and the prices will come down. Labor costs might be a little bit stickier. Uh, and I'm not so sure that's a bad thing necessarily. Uh, would I put up with a little bit more inflation for everyone to make a little more money? Yeah, I think I would. If it got really out of control uh, and it was a major problem, yeah, but right now, no, I'm not that concerned about it. Okay, so our next question is, the S&P 500 is at new highs this week. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what that means for investors? Yeah, it means you're all making money. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, it means that uh, long-term investors are doing well. Um, I think, uh, I don't know if any people are new or not CNBC viewers, but I'm a, I'm a Jack Bogle, Vanguard disciple. I'm a long-term buy and hold guy. Um, I don't do, never have uh, done market timing. I don't try to say, oh, now's the time to get in or get out. We have people on the air who do this all the time and they're great and they're terrific. But long-term investors, um, uh, I will advise you that uh, market timing is just about impossible to do on a consistent basis long-term. With market timing, remember, you have to be right twice. You have to be right going in, buying, and you have to be right when you're selling. Those are extraordinarily difficult things to do consistently over many, many years. I don't mean I just bought, you know, Freeport Mac Moran and it went up 10% in a week and I, you know, I just made $1,000. That's nice. I'm happy for you. But do that week in and week out for the next 20 years. And you'll probably find, and the academic evidence is, you will lose money against holding a simple long-term uh, uh, fund uh, like the S&P 500. So, Long-term buy and hold investors are doing great now. You can debate a lot about whether or not uh, certain stocks are going to outperform. Will tech stocks outperform industrials? You can debate that. Those are legitimate questions to debate. If you want to try to play that kind of investing game, if you want to invest on sectors or in value versus growth, go ahead and knock yourself out. I will advise you that the long-term evidence is holding broadly diversified funds a big cap fund like the S&P 500, a small cap fund like the S&P small cap, uh, an international fund and a bond fund um, is, is sufficient for almost all investors. If you want to be an active trader, 
go ahead. A lot of good shows on CNBC talking about that. But the average person is served very, very well by a simple, small number of well-diversified funds. And right now, um, the S&P 500 is sitting uh, at a new high. Uh, it's uh, Some of these stocks are considered value. Some are considered growth. Some are considered technology. Some are considered um, industrials. You know the differences. But if you own that one fund, you own all of them, essentially. So, so there's... The good news. The other piece of good news is the U.S. economy is doing very well. The reopening is proceeding very well. Uh, the vaccination programs are proceeding well. There is a legitimate debate in the market about whether this is the peak of everything right now, that we have peak economic growth. We have the peak earnings growth right now in the second and third quarters. There's some truth to this. And therefore, if we're at the peak now, how much further can the market go up for this economic cycle? That's a very interesting question. I don't know the answer. Um, we are certainly had a one heck of a run since the bottom uh, back in, in March of last year. Um, so investors should be very happy. Long-term investors should not worry about whether this is the market peak because you'd be a fool if you're a long-term investor to say, oh, I don't think the market's going to go up in the next six months. I think I'll sell everything and just sit on cash and then figure out some brilliant time to come back in. I can assure you the odds are you will not be able to do that successfully. Not long-term. You won't. So I'm happy the market's a new high. I'm happy the economy is doing well. Um, and whether or not this is the top of the market for 2021, uh, uh, I don't know. But it's certainly been a pretty good run so far. Thanks, Bob. So our next question is about Bitcoin. Um, what does the FBI seizing most of the Colonial Pipeline Bitcoin ransom mean for the cryptocurrency? I think this is really good news. And I'll tell you why. Uh, the idea that you can hide illicit transactions in Bitcoin is a bad idea. It's bad for Bitcoin. It's bad for the country. You don't want global crime syndicates to be operating, you know, with impunity. You don't want people to be holding people for economic ransom with impunity. You don't want that. It's just bad. Uh, so what's happened here is the FBI found a way to essentially access the password of these people. It's not clear what happened, but the obvious explanation here, just follow the money, the company, Colonial Pipeline, had to send the money somewhere to an address. The FBI found out what that address was and tracked it, followed activity around that address. Likely was able to gain access to the password either by intercepting communications from people around that, or maybe somebody was in on this and, and essentially flipped and told the FBI. It could be that simple. What I'm fairly certain of is it wasn't hacked in a, in a physical brute force kind of way. They didn't just break in the FBI uh, in, into, the, uh, in, into whatever account there was. Likely the password was obtained <laughs> simply by intercepting communications or somebody, somebody flipping. Uh, so all of this is, is is good. It's good for people to think they can't run international crime syndicates using Bitcoin. You don't you don't want that. That doesn't help the legitimacy of, of, of Bitcoin at all. To the extent it dropped because some people were concerned there'd be less criminal activity, I, I'm not worried about that at all. I'm a big backer of blockchain. I think it's a wonderful technology. I'm somewhat indifferent about uh, Bitcoin cryptocurrency. I think there's tremendous value in, in uh, uh, government uh, digital currencies. I understand why some people don't want that. Uh, some people want Bitcoin independent of, of the dollar, uh, uh, particularly people outside the country or in countries that are not as free or are in danger of seizing their money. So I'm fine with, with Bitcoin. I'm somewhat indifferent about whether anybody should hold it or not. I'm a big backer of blockchain. I think that's a revolutionary technology. And the more we can advance that, the better. So this week, GameStop announced its next CEO and a spike in Q1 sales. What's next for GameStop? Well, this is a hard one. You know, I'm a fundamental guy. Um, and uh, on a fundamental basis, this company is completely, you know, it's not even understandable. Um, Basically, they're an old school company that sells hardware, game consoles, and physical video games. And they have a significant collectibles business where people swap and trade old video games and 
dolls and things like that. It's a wonderful organization. I'm a, you know, I used to collect comic books in the 1960s, so I'm a collector. I understand people liking to play old video games, and I think it's wonderful. The problem is it's $300. Can you, can you, and it makes no money. And the chances of it making money are not great in the near future. Now, they have a new CEO. He says he wants to transform it into a digital company. That's fine. But most of the business is hardware. 55% of the revenues are from hardware. They sell video game consoles. Um, another 15% is, is collectibles. Um, so if you look at the business, only, yeah, I don't know, 30% or so is software. Um, they want to increase that. I think that's a wonderful. They should try. Um, but <laughs> the competition in the digital gaming business is intense. I mean, it's pretty serious. There are good people out there. So, you know, let's assume they could make a dollar somewhere down the road. They're losing money now. Okay, so they make a dollar, 300, now they have a 300 PE price to earnings ratio. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Remember, the S&P is 20 times forward earnings. So uh, I, I think I like GameStop. I, I'm not going to argue with people who want to trade GameStop. But at $300, just think about what it means on a, on a long term basis. I hope the company is successful. I hope the neat new CEO does transform it into a digital company, but it's a tough road to hoe for them. And at $300, you know, I think I've said enough about, about that. I wish them well. I hope they succeed. Yeah, it'll definitely be interesting to see where it goes from here. Um, so this week you spoke with SEC Chair Gary Gensler. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your conversation. Well, Gensler is a fascinating guy because he's got a very interesting background. He was the head of the CFTC, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, which regulates the futures market. This is a very smart guy. He taught at MIT. He taught Bitcoin, uh, cryptocurrency. So he is aware of the issues. Now, it's very clear that he's a little concerned about what he calls gamification of trading, and he should be. He thinks that a lot of these apps like Robinhood basically encourage people to trade. And the academic literature indicates that people who trade too much tend to lose money. That's a fact. I mean, I completely agree with him on that. So to the extent that you have sites where you go on it and you have you know, balloons going off every time you make a trade to encourage you to keep trading, that gamification of trading historically in generally causes people to lose money in the long term by constantly trading. It's, it's not the stock. It's constantly trading in and out. Historically, generally, will lose money for people. This is, a, again, these are academic studies. It anything to do with GameStop or Reddit or Robinhood or anything like that. It has to do with the historical trend. People tend to overtrade uh, and tend to lose money when they overtrade. So I think he's right to be concerned about that. I, he doesn't have a – he hasn't tipped his hand on what, if anything, he's going to do about this. But you're going to see a report from him in the next few months. Uh, about GameStop slash Reddit slash Robinhood and about all of this and what, <clears throat> if anything, uh, responsibility the SEC has for telling people or warning people about things like uh, gamification of trading and what's what's uh, what's going on with that. He's also concerned about this whole issue about payment for order. When you're on a Schwab account or um, you know any of these other uh, e-brokers and you place an order to buy whatever, 100 shares of IBM, the order doesn't go actually to an exchange floor. It actually goes to a broker, uh, a, a market maker, actually, who probably will match off that 100 shares you want to buy with 100 shares to sell that they have internally. The two biggest market makers there are Citadel and Virtu. And he's unhappy with the fact that two market makers essentially control this business. It's almost 40% of all the volume. And he's also unhappy with the fact that he he he, he feels that there should be more competition, and he'd also like to see more trading done on what are called the lit exchanges, the New York Stock Exchange and the at Nasdaq, rather than having these eternal internalizers match it off. I think there's some good reason to support generally the idea of trading on exchanges um, where uh, the, the bids and offers are clearly visible. Uh, and I think it would help maybe improve pricing a little bit. So generally, I understand what he's concerned about. The question is, what, if anything, um, he's going to be able to do about that. Uh, on crypto, 
you know, he everyone seems to think that just because he taught crypto at MIT, suddenly he's going to be in favor of, you know, Bitcoin and making it more available. We need more regulation around Bitcoin, but Bitcoin itself is a commodity that's under the regulation of the CFTC. However, Bitcoin ETFs will be regulated by the SEC. There is a gap now. Bitcoin exchanges, Bitcoin wallets, it's not clear who's regulating them. He doesn't know. And this is a problem. He wants to get clarity on who's going to regulate, for example, a Bitcoin exchange, a, a, a Coinbase or something like that. And I think he is looking for some cover from Congress to authorize, to specifically say the SEC is going to control this. And then he's going to make regulations. He feels people need to be more protected. Uh, and I think so, too. I am not convinced that, you know, everybody is safe from getting their assets stolen in these uh, or from custody issues or from fraud and manipulation, particularly on foreign markets. Um, so I, I think he's probably doing the right thing. Um, finally, on climate change, you know, they're, they're very serious about this. They, they think that companies should tell them, the SEC, about what policies they have on climate change. This is what I call a nudge. It's not saying you're violating regulations. It's just saying we want to know what policies you have because we're interested. Republicans say this is wrong. This is not part of your mandate. Um, and Gensler is going to ignore them. He's going to push back and say, yes, it is, because climate change affects, uh, is materially important for investors. It can affect their investments, and therefore we should know more about what if any policies these companies have. So those are sort of the big three, the climate change, the, the Bitcoin, uh, and the, the whole thing around gamification of trading. And I, I think considering um, all the stuff that's going on, he's done a pretty good job so far. What he's been saying is, here's what I'm concerned about, those three things. I've been asking my staff about what we should be doing about it, and I'll get back to you soon about what where I think we should be going. But he's already tipped his hand a little bit, and I think you're going to hear a lot more in the next two or three months about what, what he's going to do, particularly on a Bitcoin ETF down the road. Well, we'll definitely be looking out for that. Um, so our last question, um, since we last talked to you, you've returned to the New York Stock Exchange. How does it feel being back? You know, it feels really good. I, I wanted to be the first one back. I mean, the NYSE has been reopened since May of last year, but it's been closed to the media. I'm sort of the grand old man on the floor. I've been on the floor since 1997. Uh, so I'm the senior guy. And uh, this is a leader. You're supposed to be the first one back in. Um, and I was pleased that we were. Uh, and they were really nice to me. You know, the, the head of the NYSE came down, said hello, and gave me the gavel, which is a ceremonial thing. You know, you hit the gavel to open uh, the trading every day. So it was really nice. I think the NYSE is very emblematic of what's happening all over the country. And that is the country's reopening, but it's slow. Um, so there's, yeah, I don't know, 35, 40% of the people back on the floor. I hope more will come back. I know more will come, be coming back. And in fact, in the three weeks since I've been back, more have come back. So this is sort of like the whole country. Um, the question is how many people ultimately will come back? And you see how the country is unfolding. We already have a lot of companies saying, uh, look what Apple did. So we'd like to see people start coming back into the office three days a week and two days out in September. Some people objected to that. Some people will. Some people don't want to go back under any circumstances. So this is a whole slow evolution. There is not one answer. Uh, companies are going to have to figure out, can they get the same level of productivity if people just go work home two days a week? And maybe that is a feasible idea. Um, I, I think in some circumstances, yes, it can be. Um, so it, the, the point is, I wanted to be the first one back. I see the NYSE is very representative of how the country is, is slowly unfolding. And I think it's I think it's it's terrific. I'm very happy with you know the overall progress. I mean, considering what a disaster this was. I mean, imagine this two years ago, if I would have told you, hey, you know what, we're going to have a global pandemic. It's going to shut down the entire world. We're going to induce a global recession. The first time this ever happened, we actually induced a recession. We told everyone to go home. That, that's an, in, an induced recession. 
Think how crazy that is. Two years ago, you said, no, that's like some science fiction story. Nobody, that's so implausible, it wouldn't even show up in anybody's scenario. It's such a black swan. And it did happen. This goes to show you, if it doesn't make you a little bit humble about, you know, thinking you're in completely control of things, stuff comes out of left field on you. But look, I think we've handled it very well. And I'm, I'm very optimistic, Katie. I hope you are too. Yes, definitely. And it's been great to see you back there. So um, thank you again so much for joining us, Bob. And thank you so much to everyone for tuning in today. And we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Thank you. And again, great questions, everybody. You're all asking the right questions. Smart crowd. Appreciate it. Right. Keep, keep, uh, keep writing in.